I think this will take up most of the time. If there are other questions that come in or something not clear, you can ask in the chat. Um, but I think the time will be occupied with the questions. So the first question is, given surging rates, and by the way, these questions are all anonymous. I don't know if we've asked these questions um, and uh, they've been compiled for me. <clears throat> given surging rates of Omicron variant, is it thought obligatory these days to attend Juma prayer assuming masks are required? No, this is more of a, a subjective thing. If people don't feel safe, or if people are high risk, or if people have underlying conditions, or if people are not vaccinated or not boosted, and you don't feel safe, you don't have an obligation to come to Juma. You can pray Juma at home. Uh, the mosque, however, will remain open, of course, and we continue to take our precautions with social distancing with the prayer time, the mask requirement vaccine requirement, et cetera. But if you personally don't feel safe, then you have the right not to come to Juma and to pray the Lord. But keep in mind that as the mosque, we are doing everything, you know, cleaning the mosque, uh, sanitizing, so on and so forth. But if you don't feel safe, you don't have to come. Just like if you didn't, if you wouldn't feel safe if there was a storm outside. Maybe one person doesn't feel safe driving in the storm, but another person feels comfortable. So there's a level of subjectivity to it. But if you don't feel safe, that is the Sharia criteria that allow you not to have to come to the mosque and uh, you can pray Dhuhr instead. Um, <clears throat> Pornography is a major problem that is on the rise in both Muslim and non-Muslim communities. Could you please address how this practice can be harmful, not only for those seeking to get married, but also for those already married? It is a problem. As the questioner has mentioned, <clears throat> I've actually had a little bit of experience dealing with it in some couples therapy. Um, so the questioner is right to mention people that are married and unmarried. Uh, and I, mean, I don't know what I'm supposed to say about it, other than it is a problem. And one of the problems of it, or I think there are two major problems to it, or three major problems to it. Number one <clears throat> is that it projects a false reality. Um, so people that are consumed by pornography, and of course pornography, it's like saying drugs. There, there's a lot of different types of drugs, a lot of different types of pornography. So of course we're making blanket statements, <clears throat> but it projects a false sense of reality, a false sense in this case of the reality of the, of the intimate relation uh, between people. And that false reality can end up messing up actual intimate relationships in the future for people. And it has destroyed marriages and, and whatnot for that reason. But another second problem with it is that it's addictive. So there is a, a rush of dopamine that happens with it and it becomes addictive. People can end up spending hours and hours and hours on it, numbing them to the effects of it. <clears throat> and number three is that there is a relationship between pornography and violence, whether it be violence, in intimacy or in the intimate relationship. And there have been some studies, I know that Sheikh Hamza Yusuf is very into this specific aspect of the link between extremism, violent extremism and pornography. And I think there are some studies that, that demonstrate that um, there's a high usage, a high viewership of pornography among these people. So these three things are, are, that come to mind are three of the larger, the larger problems. Another challenge with pornography is that it is becoming more normalized. And uh, you find it in advertisement, <clears throat> suggestions of pornography. Yeah, they are. You find it in mainstream yeah, uh, viewership, yeah. mainstream streaming platforms, different shades of it, even if it's on the softer side of pornography, on the pornography scale, but you still find it nonetheless. So it's becoming more normal. And that's really the challenge is it's sort of kind of, it's kind of caving in on all of us. And we have to remember that we have an obligation to lower our gaze. This is, there's a question here later that will come about lowering the gaze, but this is an issue that we need to lower the gaze at. And that's something that we want to try to prevent ourselves from viewing because when it comes inside, it, it has deep, deep spiritual, negative spiritual impact. 
Um, and you know, nothing is is beyond fixing, but it can have great impact, negative impact for both men and women. <clears throat> okay, for a woman who was unable to Ask through Ramadan due to pregnancy or breastfeeding, what are her options for making up the fasting? I know there's an option to donate, but how does she know how much to donate? If a woman is pregnant or nursing a, ch a young child, this takes the ruling of the person who is sick, a temporary sickness, meaning that there's a temporary uh, reason why she would break her fast, <clears throat> whether it's because she's worried about her own self, her, her well-being, or the well-being of the child. There are different opinions, but the opinion that we give the fatwa based on is that for every day that you miss, you have to make up that day. So you don't have to worry about the expiation, meaning pay. There are other, so not, there are other opinions that say you have to pay, but forget about that for right now. The simple opinion, to make it simple for everyone, is that if you make miss a day because you're pregnant, just like if you miss a day because you had your menstrual cycle or you miss a day uh, because of feeding, the breastfeeding, whatever, uh, whatever those days are, you have to make up eventually. The idea of paying instead of fasting or making up the public, making up the day is in cases where you cannot fast, which means that the sickness is permanent, uh, you know, God forbid. Uh, sometimes people are too old to fast, for example, or people have uh, medical <coughs> medical conditions that preclude them from fasting in general. In those cases, they're going to pay the expiation. But something like pregnancy or breastfeeding, it's something temporary. So you make up the day uh, that you miss. Just like if you were a man and if you were sick or traveling and you missed the day, you would make up the day that you missed. <clears throat> okay. While performing ablution, starting from hand to mouth, nose, face, sometimes I go to wash my feet, forgetting to wash the arms. And then remember that I have not wiped the head and cleaned the ears. Have I to start illusion from the beginning? Yes, khurujan min al khilaf. I mean, there are different opinions about the order, but most of the opinions, uh, the fiqhia positions are that the order is an obligation. So if you have a problem with the order of wudu and it's a constant problem, then what you can do is you can start by making the bare minimum wudu until that problem goes away, which is to wash your face, and then to wash your right arm, your left arm, your head, and then your right foot and your left foot. And that's it. And don't do the other things. By minimizing and cutting out the sunnah acts, it might be easier for you to remember the order. So again, that would be the face, the right arm, the hand and up to the elbow, the left, the head, the right foot, and the left foot up to the ankle. Thank you. Okay, following the recent successful heart transplant with a pig heart performed by a Muslim surgeon, I would like to know how Muslim scholars in the Sharia, like in Al-Azhar, will approach this event. For a long time now, pig valves are used to replace damaged valves in the ear. In the Sharia, specifically in the Shafi Madhab, you are allowed to use in, impure substances for medical purposes. Um, so, this is actually an easy one. Uh, the pig is obviously universally, or not universally, but in the three main schools of Sunni Islam is considered nejis, is considered ritually impure with the exception of the Maliki Madhab, <clears throat> which considers all, uh, all animals to be pure. But all Muslims, regardless of the uh, school of thought or their sect, uh, agree that the pig is impermissible to eat and to consume, obviously. But in the case of medical uh, medicine, the Sharia is very liberal. So whether it be medicines that intoxicate, whether it be med medicines that have uh, ritually and then in it, ritually impure, all of those things would be considered permissible in the case of, of medicine, especially if there are no other substances or no other alternatives. <clears throat> so that would be okay. I don't know if this is a case in which there are no other alternatives. So that's something that eludes me. I forgot to look into that. But if there are no other alternatives, then there's nothing wrong with that, inshallah.
This is based on the hadith of drinking the, the urine of the cow for medical purposes. So the Shafi'is take that hadith as a principle that in cases of medicine, because the, the urine is considered medicine, it's considered ritually impure. So in cases of medicine, ritually impure najasa is allowed. Camel, right? No. Cam uh, camel, sorry. So, what did I say? Say the cow? Cow. Oh, sorry. The the camel. Camel. <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that. It's getting borrowed in India. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> We're not going to go down that road. I'm sorry. I made a mistake. <clears throat> you know what I was trying to say. Is it compulsory for women to cover the head when reciting the Quran? No. The Prophet Sassan used to recite the Quran and make dhikr in all his circumstances, except if he was in a state of major ritual impurity, uh, Geneva. But other than that, there's no nothing should preclude you from reading the Quran. If a woman is by herself, or if she's at home, or she's amongst other women, she doesn't have to cover. Now, some women cover when they read the Quran out of honoring that this is the book of Allah, this is the Quran, and that's that's fine. That's a that's a noble practice, but it's not a condition. In some books, in classical books of Islam, you'll read stuff like that. You'll read, for example, that you shouldn't go into the bathroom unless your head is covered. It's not a sunnah. It's just a practice because then the bathrooms were usually places that were filthy. And, and I've said this before, our modern bathrooms are more luxurious than the palaces of Caesar and, and Kisra were, you know, when you read in history. So the, 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 the modern bathroom has completely changed. So those type of things were out of caution, out of adab, you know, general, uh, uh, what was considered proprietary, but it's not a, it's not a condition. Uh, you'll read in the books, for example, you can't accept a testimony from a man whose head is not covered. That's because at that time, there was you know, no man no, would go out in the Muslim majority area without his head covered in a cap or a turban or something. But that doesn't mean now, if you don't have your head covered, you can't accept somebody's testimony because it's not considered normal. So sometimes these things change. This is one of those issues which it's not a condition, but people will have written about it as a way of honoring the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When one recites the Quran, can one have intentions of dedicating to someone who has passed away, parents or child, some say it's not permissible. Don't pay attention to the people that say it's not permissible because they're wrong. Because reciting the Quran with the intention of donating or uh, dedicating the reward of that recitation to the person is something that is firmly established. Where is it firmly established? Because we can make Hajj for people who have passed away. The Hajj, Everything is included in the Hajj. The Hajj includes recitation of the Quran, it includes fasting, it includes tawaf, it includes siyam. Everything uh, in the Hajj, when you do the Hajj, for example, for a parent or a grandparent or somebody, and you dedicate the reward of the Hajj to that person. So whatever, all of it goes, its individual parts go, with the exception of the prayer. Because Allah Ta'ala says about the prayer, in the salata kanat al mu'mina kitab al mawquta, that the prayer is a specifically assigned act for the person. So we cannot make up prayers for people who have passed because the prayer is something that Allah Ta'ala says is linked to us individually. But everything else, fasting, reading Quran, charity, tawaf, sa'i, the jamara, all of these things, it all sadaqah, any type of charity. You can do that with the intention that that reward goes to the deceased. So the people that say that this is not permissible, the problem with this mentality is that they believe, maybe they haven't acknowledged it, but they believe that death is the end of life. That's the problem. Death is not the end of life. Death is moving from one form of life to another form of life. If you believe that death is khalas, you're done. If there's nobody there, that's when you start saying it's haram to go to visit the saints, it's haram to go to the graveyard, it's haram to do this, it's haram to do that, because in the back of your mind, you're saying there's nothing there. But we know that that's not true. What, if, if that were true, why do we wash the body, shroud the body, pray over the body in the masjid, and then go bury the body? Why don't we just throw it in the street or burn it? Because there's still a body there, there's still life. Right? Isn't there a body still there? Okay, maybe the soul has left the body, but there's still a body there. Why do we do the talqeen and we talk to the dead person in the grave and say the angels are going to come? Why would we talk to the dead person if the person is not there? So the, the problem of this, the Salafi thing is that they don't understand death or life for that matter. Please, please clarify the differences between zakah and sadaqah in simple form. Zakah is a specific 
act of worship that has specific conditions that when you have excess liquid wealth above a certain amount that amount is called the nisab that you donate or you have to give 2.5 percent of that to one or more of the eight categories of zakat mentioned in surah the tawbah that's what zakat is sadaqa charity is anything that you do outside of that whether you give money outside of that or whether you donate your time or whether you donate clothes or you donate a service or you're just doing something that's charitable that's outside of that specific setup so charity is much much broader than zakat you might not be a person that has any wealth that necessitates zakat but still you give money that would be considered charity so zakat think of it like prayer the, the prayer time has to come in, you have to have wudu, you have to face Mecca, the place has to be clean, you have to do all of the rakats, then you check your prayer. That's like zakat. Sadaqa is you just walk into the mosque and you just pray two rakats, just for the sake of it. That's like sadaqa, you just give for the sake of it. So that's the difference between the two. If you have excess liquid wealth above the nisab, one year has passed, one lunar year has passed, you have complete access, control, and link to 10 of that money, then you're going to give 2.5% to one of the one or more of those categories in uh, Surah Al-Tawbah. That is the zakat. Of course, if you have livestock, I mean, none of you have livestock that I know, but if you have livestock in your backyard somewhere, there, there could be zakat on that. You also probably will get in trouble with the county, but there is zakat for livestock as well. There's zakat on gold and silver. There's zakat on trade goods for those of you who trade. But I just say liquid money because that's usually what we pay zakat. When you say trade goods, does it mean inventory if you're a business? If you're trading. Okay. So I I buy um, green coffee and I sell green coffee. But if that's trade, that tijar. But if I buy green coffee and I roast it and I pack it, I've altered it, that's not trade. That's industry, it's something else. So the trade is when you buy and sell the same item. Then at the end of the year, you'll have to take stock of the inventory and with certain conditions you pay zakat for traders, but not for people that are processing the, the material. You might buy individual raw material, but you're processing them, for example. There's no, that's not, there's no zakat on that. So this is all the value of the inventory that you have? Uh, and because there could be counting issues as well, right? It's not just, you have it for the full year, that the inventory has to be there. Yeah, for the full year, and it has to be above the Nisab. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so how would you calculate that? For example, I have a gas station, right? So how would you calculate the zakat if I have like, $30,000 of gas in the tank. But the, the, the gas in the tank is not staying in that tank for a year. The gas could be. It would also go bad. Okay. And then you will we'll fine you for selling bad gas. <laughs> and no, you really probably put water in it too, the water it down. <laughs> no, no, because you're always replenishing it. So then so th there's no year. So you lose that one condition of the having the whole year. Thank you for telling I was going to raise the Okay. By the way, if I haven't said this week, everyone needs to donate to ICCP. Everyone online, please. Are we online or what's that screen? Online. Are you sure? I forgot to mention, people need to donate to the message. I'll make this message again on Friday. Actually, maybe I can stop asking, answering the question until we get a certain number. I'm just fine. We'll save that for another one. Okay. Also, if one wants to give something in remembrance of a person who has passed away, does this constitute sadaqa? Yes, the Prophet ﷺ said that when you pass away, your hisab, your uh, 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 scale of deeds stops, except for three things. If you knowledge that you've left behind, or some sadaqa, some charity that you've engaged with that keeps on going, sadaqa jariya, or waladun salah yadullah, or a pious ancestor or just a descendant that prays for you. Now that that person doesn't have to be your blood relative, it could be the community, but you may go out for the deceased. So anything that you do for the deceased is going to go to the deceased, inshallah. 
So for those of you, for example, who have parents who have passed away, it's always a good habit that when you donate money or when you feed somebody like in Ramadan, you always include your parents in that niyyah, in that intention, as a, as a habit, as a practice, to always be giving back to your parents. one wants to give something in remembrance of a person who has passed away, does this constitute a sub? Yeah. And so we donate the, these clothes and I want, you know, I'm doing this for my for my grandmother. I'm doing this for my parents. Of course, why not? Inshallah. Allah's generous. Can I hang pictures of my relatives in the house? Yeah. Pictures are not haram. The, the picture, the photograph, the picture or image like from the phone, this is not the surah that is talked about in the hadith. As a matter of fact, referring to these pictures or photographs as a surah in the Arabic language is a mistranslation. And this is one of the problems why many people still think that pictures are haram. Because there are hadith that talk about the surah being haram. The surah of the hadith is a three-dimensional statue image made with the purpose of worship. The photograph is not that. The photograph is something completely different. So the photographs are not haram. And, and Sheikh Bakhit al Muti'i, who was the Grand Mufti of Egypt in the 1920s, he wrote a little book called Al Jawab al Shafi fi Ibahat al Surah al Fotografi, the clear answer to the permissibility of photographs. And he, and he demonstrates the argument, sort of what I'm talking about. So this is one of the um, laments of mis the, the, the problems with translation of modern Arabic. We, in modern Arabic, we refer, if somebody had like a picture, say, oh, Surah. We said this is a, a picture, but the, that's not the, the sh another word should have been used for that because the surah in the in the language of the Arabs means something else. What is haram is if you have a statue that you have for worship. Uh, that is, I mean, obviously that's like you know, a statue of David or, or like the statue of Nike or one of these like you know famous statues. And we're not going to put that in our house. But even if you inherited something like that, you wouldn't destroy it, right? Because it's World heritage, so you donate it to a museum or something like that. So don't get any wild ideas. <clears throat> and we coexist with the haram too. That's also another concept that we forget about. So just because you know, in many Muslim countries <coughs> or Muslim uh, majority cities, you'll find statues and busts and stuff like that. So even though that might technically be arguable that it's haram from the Sharia point of view, we don't go and destroy public property. Because there's this concept of coexisting with the Haram. Remember that the Prophet Sallallahu coexisted with the idols in the Kaaba until the last year of his prophecy when he conquered Mecca and then he removed the idols. But all throughout his prophecy, he prayed Sassan to, to the Kaaba, even though there were 360 idols inside and outside the Kaaba. He wasn't praying to the idols, right? But he was coexisting with it until the opportunity came for him to remove them, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Why did Allah Ta'ala only name boy prophets in the Quran? He didn't only name boy prophets in the Quran. Who said that? Allah says we give as an example to all of the believers the wife of Pharaoh who asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to save her from Fir'aun, to build her a, a, a place in paradise. And we give as an example to all the believers, Mary, the mother of Christ, so on and so forth. Ibn Hazm says that these women were prophets and Moses' mother. And we have revealed to the mother of Muhammad that Allah ta'ala uses the same word, wahi, revelation. Now the others, all of they say, yeah, and he kind of inspired the mother of Moses. Because Ibn Hazm read it, you know, literally. When Allah says, he could have used another word. He said, well, you know, we, 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 we Mary, Allah Ta'ala told Mary when she was experiencing uh, the pains of labor to shake the, the palm trees, the, the date tree. So Ibn Hazm says that these references mean that these women were prophets. So it's a difference of opinion. So follow the opinion that says that these women are prophets, and then you'll know that Allah Ta'ala has mentioned them in the Quran and has given them as an example for all believers. <clears throat> 
Concerns that come up with the imams who refuse to do nikah of a non-Muslim male to a Muslim woman. This has become a major issue I read in the Washington Post as well. Is the Fiqh Council of North America looking into this? What are your thoughts about this? It also mentioned that the non-Muslim men were practicing the religions as well, fasting and sometimes prayer as well, but the imams would not agree to consummate the marriage either. If we want to propagate the religion in the U.S., these constraints will be disadvantaged to Muslims. First of all, we don't want to propagate Islam. That's also that we don't. We just want to practice Islam. Propagating Islam just happens. Allah Allah Taala does not guide who you want, who we want, but Allah guides who He wills. So this, we are not a propagating faith. We are not a proselytizing faith. Evangelical Christians, Buddhists, they 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 proselytize. Uh, Mormons, not us. That's a misconception. And that type of proselytizing, I would argue, me as Tark, I would argue is completely anti-Islam. We need to practice our faith. And if people want to learn about it, we can teach them about it. And we want to get involved in the public uh, domain and issues that concern all of the community. And we want to add to the conversation. Yeah, that's that's fine. But I, I, whether somebody wants to believe in Muslim, whether someone wants to believe in Islam or not, that's not our business. Women sha'a fayyumin, women sha'a fayyakfur. So the idea that we want to you know, propagate or that's really not our issue at all. The issue of marriage in Islam or the issue of marriage in general is always in religion, something that is related to the divine. It has nothing to do with our understanding. It is always a function of religion. And all religions and their orthodox expressions, they all don't allow cross marriage, across religious marriages. Except people that change their religion. That's that that happens all the time. But we don't, we're not allowed to change our religion, right? And we alhamdulillah we have not and will not. So this is not an issue of there's something to look into. It's it's not permissible. All Muslim madahib, all sects, Sunni and Shia, the Muslims of the past, the Muslims of the present, Muslims of the East, the Muslims of the West, the Muslims of the North, the Muslims of the, every single Muslim is in agreement on this issue that there is not permissible for a Muslim woman to marry outside the faith or for a Muslim man for that marriage outside of the faith, except in certain specific instances with a certain type of Christianity or Judaism, that's it. Even, even outside of those two faiths, even though we argue that the concept of people of the book Ahl al-Kitab is larger than Jews and Christians, even in that case, it's not permissible. No one has ever said it's permissible for a Muslim man to marry a Zoroastrian, for example, or for a Buddhist or a Hindu or something like that. So this is not an issue of, it doesn't sound cool, we need to rethink it. There's some things that we can't rethink because this is how the religion is. This is from the text of the Quran. All religions are like this, and all the orthodox religions that is. And it's just an issue of, of ijma, of consensus. There's nothing that we can do about it. Um, and there's no rational reason why, by the way. Some ulama will say, oh, because the children follow the religion of the man. That's also not a real explanation. There's no, no. If someone does their shahada, like, yeah, but then they're Muslim. Exactly. Yeah, but that's not what the question is. The question is about a Muslim woman marrying outside of the faith. You know, if somebody says the shahada, then that counts. These rational explanations that you read about also are not uh, real explanations. Uh, maybe in some scenario, the children follow the religion of the, the Jews are make the opposite argument. They say that the children follow the religion of the woman, which is why Judaism is passed on through the women, not through the male, for example. So just because you just because the people before us try to articulate these things doesn't mean that all of their artic articulations necessarily make sense. The real answer is that Allah says so in the Quran. It's universally understood. It's an issue of consensus between Sunnis and everyone. It's one of those issues that we all agree on, and it is what it is. Okay. But as Noor said, if somebody says the Shahada, the Shahada counts. Uh, That's before marriage. Before ma What do you mean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. Now, what happens if you find people that are, she does it anyway, she gets married. You know, then they have kids. It becomes another another problem. I'm not going to answer that question, but I, I state the question. 
Maybe next one you can talk about that. <laughs> okay, what does bid'ah and fitna mean? Where does one draw the line when when both the Quran and Sunnah are silent, and then some of our mosques are confronted by the Haram police, and young people are turned off? I think there's a lot going on in that question. So first of all, there should be no Haram police. So if there are people in in different mosques who go around pointing out all of the haram people, then we should ask them politely to go to another mosque. <laughs> because, you know, that's not that's not the way of Islam. That's not the way. And if there are ulama or there's an imam or there's somebody who's been given that task, that's different than they can help guide the community. But people going around, like, oh, your prayer was wrong or your fasting was wrong. That, that's, that's not the way of Islam. That's not the way of the Salaf. So we don't want that. We don't want the haram police or the halal police for that matter. But we want a you know, safe environment where we can worship and we can be inspired, so on and so forth. Um, because not only are young people turned off, but people in general are turned off. And we've mentioned this before, that many, many people are unmasked you know, in this country. Many, many people don't even go to the mosque at all. Haven't you noticed that we are the same people that always show up, the same few people? You know, right? So there are, most people don't want to come to the masjid. So, this is one of the reasons why, because they don't feel safe coming. And if you don't feel safe coming, then we have failed. So uh, that's a big, big problem. People should be welcome to come, so on and so forth. And what is what is the difference between bid'ah and fitna? A fitna is some type of uh, social, you know, upheaval or calamity, or a potential you know, controversy that can lead to division through the community. That's what a fitna is. It could be as simple as, um, you know, I come to leave the mosque and I don't find my shoes and, you know, I, next week I see some other brother wearing my shoes and I accuse him of stealing. And so if we created this, you know, fitna. So someone's gonna, some people will be on my side and then some people will be on the other side and some people will leave all together because they this mosque, they don't want to be a part of it. That's like a fitna. Or there are the big fitnas which end up becoming warfare and nations fighting against one another, conflict, okay? Allah Ta'ala says, Al-fitnatu ashaddu min al -qabr. And in another verse, he says, Al-fitnatu akbaru min al -qabr. He says that fitna, this type of, of social upheaval is worse than manslaughter. It's worse than killing somebody. That's how bad divisiveness is. And I, I was thinking about this the other day, I don't know why, but I was thinking about this vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Civil War, the American Civil War. And I concluded that that was the, the, the crime of the Civil War, the, the crime, the major crime of the Civil War was not slavery, or it was not states' rights over the federal, federal rights. It was, it was splitting the union. And that's what Allah says in the Quran, and fitna to That's how bad it is to split a community. That was the crime of the Confederacy, or that's the crime of the Civil War, is that splitting the union of the nation. So somebody killing somebody in cold blood is less of a problem than fitna. And that's why we have to you know, stay away from fitna as much as humanly possible. We sense it or we feel it in the community, not to add to it. Bid'ah is something different. A bid'ah is something that is new, that is done. And the bid'ah in Islam falls under one of the five categories of the rulings of the Sharia. Either the bid'ah is necessary, or the bid'ah is recommended, or the bid'ah is permissible, or the bid'ah is disliked, or the bid'ah is haram. And there are examples. So for example, the Mus'haf, the Quran that we have, this is a bid'ah that was necessary. The Sahaba, the Prophet did not order the companions to put the Quran in one volume and write it out. But, but there was a necessity. If we didn't have that, we would have lost the Quran. That was a bid'ah. The Taraweeh prayer, that's a bid'ah that became recommended. So it's a sunnah from the time of the Sahaba up until our time we pray the, the Taraweeh prayer in the month of Ramadan, expanding the mosque. It's a bid'ah that, that we need. Have, we don't have it, but the mihrab in the mosque when the imam prays, that's a bid'ah. There was no mihrab at the time of the Prophet Sasa. The microphone out? The battery? 
and using a microphone in the mosque is a bid'ah. All of these things are considered bid'ah. What is the, is the bid'ah good or is the bid'ah bad? It depends what it is, what the act is. Okay? So that's what a bid'ah is. But how come in the khutbah we say, uh, all bid'ah or misguidance and all misguidance is in the hellfire? It means all misguidance that is not based on principles of the Quran and Sunnah. The Prophet said, Whoever invents something in this religion of ours that is not from it, then it is rejected. But if it is from it, if it's based on a principle, So the bid'ah is something that is new, a newly invented matter, and it falls under one of the five categories of the Sharia. The Prophet ﷺ said, Man hadha ma laysa minhu Whoever invents something in Islam that is not from Islam, then it is rejected. But if it is from something from Islam, then it's accepted. And that's why we have some bid'ahs that we've accepted and that we have to have so on and so forth. So that's the difference between bid'ah and fitna. The thing about the haram police, most people that go around saying, oh, your prayer is wrong, most people that do that usually have the least amount of knowledge, in my experience. Because when you start to study Islam and you start to study the Sharia, the Quran and all of that, you start to realize how wide it is and how plural it is and how flexible it is. And we saw our teachers who, you know, we consider our authority figures and, you know, the, the likes of which we'll never see ever again, so on and so forth, hardly criticize people or hardly point out anything. We, we lived like that. That's what we, how we interacted with them. Because they always find a way out for the person or another opinion, so on and so forth. That's the way of the setup. And the way of the setup is to be easy with these things. And only to point out something if you know absolutely that it's wrong, or if you've been placed in a position in the community to point out those things. But we're not here to judge one another or to you know point things out. And it happens all the time. And for some reason, it happens to sisters more than it happens to men. I don't know why. And my daughter had a recent incident like that in Egypt. Actually, in Medina, somebody told her or hijab is not right or something like that. So, I mean, it happens. It's, it's going to continue to happen, but it's wrong. Is it bad to stand and drink a glass of water? No, it's not bad or haram, but the sunnah is to uh, drink sitting. But it's, that doesn't mean that you can't drink standing up. My son is left-handed, and he likes to eat with the fingers of his left hand. Is this bad? He gets mad when I correct him. Allah does not burden the soul except with what it can bear. If you're left-handed and that's your dominant hand, then it's okay. If you can't eat with your right and you, you might mess up your the food and the drink and spill it everywhere if you eat with your right. So it's not haram. Allah Ta'ala created you that way. The sunnah is to eat with the right when the right by itself is engaged. So I want to go grab a, a sip of this, so I grab it with my right hand. But because I'm holding this pen, or maybe I'm on the phone. So if I was like this and I took a sip, that wouldn't be haram because both hands are engaged. Right? That's the hadith that's narrated in Ahmed. People don't realize that. The, I, the, the hadith about eating with the right means only when the right hand is engaged. But if both hands are engaged in the process of eating, then the Prophet doesn't ate with both the left and the right. So for example, if you have a fork and knife and you're eating in Western style where the fork is in the left and you're cutting with the right, and then you eat. Both hands are engaged. That's that's sunnah, because that's how the Prophet ﷺ ate when both hands were engaged. That's just an aside. But as far as the questioner, if the child is left-handed, there's nothing wrong with eating with your left hand. Now you kind of Allah the The eating and the grooming, physical grooming, these are all things that are are from the from the sunnah. So following the sunnah is going to be better than not following the sunnah, but it doesn't mean not following the sunnah in these cases is necessarily how. Can women go to the burial ground where the burial takes place? 
Yes, this is an example of abrogation nest in the Sunnah. The Prophet said, I used to forbid you from attending or from visiting the graves. Now I say visit the graves. Okay, so this is an example. When we teach Usul al-Fiqh, this is an example of abrogation nest in the Sunnah. That the Prophet used to forbid uh, women from visiting the graves. And then he said, no, now you should go visit because in it is a great reminder. So there's nothing wrong with that. Can male or female view the body of a deceased after the shrouding is done? In some cultures, they say this is bad for the soul of the deceased. Well, when we shroud the body, we cover the, we, we shroud above the head and then below the feet. So do you mean the shrouded body? There's nothing wrong with seeing that because we bring the body to the mosque to pray. Uh, if you if if you mean like viewing like the face, which is not an Islamic practice, but it's in a Western practice, it's not haram, but it's not our way. It's not our sunnah is to shroud the entire body. Uh, if it's looking at the naked body, the the aura of the of the body has to be covered. Um, men cannot wash women, and women cannot wash men, even if it's your spouse. This is an issue of agreement amongst the fuqaha, with the exception of the position of Imam Ali Alayhi Imam Ali washed Sayyidah Fatima, but this is contrary to all evidence and all of the madahid. Uh, so we don't allow that, and maybe there was a special circumstance in that case for washing, but, but the same gender wash and shroud the body. Uh, but seeing the body in the ways that I mentioned, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but the body should be covered, and the face should be covered, because you take the shroud and you take it above, you tie it above here and then above and, and okay. below. I think some Muslims even get divorced. The family and others want to see the body here, just before or after Janaza prayer. So it's not this. They want to see the face. Is that allowed? It's not an issue allowed. I wouldn't do it because it's not. That's not what we do. The 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 way we honor the deceased is to wash, shroud, pray, and bury as quickly as possible. So once it's covered, you cannot open it. It's not an issue of halal and haram. It's just an issue of that this could, this could introduce, this is a bid'ah. This would be a, a reprehensible bid'ah. We don't do that. I mean, the body is, we're, we're here to honor. We have an obligation, a communal obligation, to take care of this person until we put them into the ground, do the talqeen, and bury them properly. So we don't want to do anything that will delay that or all of those things are for the living, not for the deceased. But our teaching is to honor the person that has been deceased. So we don't wait. Like if somebody dies, uh, we bury them. Even if the family, all the family member hasn't come, you know, maybe they're in other countries or coming or their stuff. We don't wait we, because we're honoring the person who has died, not waiting for the family member. So it's not an issue. It's not an issue of halal and haram. But it definitely would be a bid'ah. But um, there are visitors who come from overseas and they want to view the six bodies. Is that uh, bad for the soul? I mean, not that I know, but I would do that at the place where the body is washed. Yeah. I think by the time we come to the masjid to do the Janaza prayer, I think it's too late for that. The first times where the viewing done at the at the funeral home, one is just washed and the the first time. Sure. I mean that that's fine. That's fine. But you know, once you once we do the kafan and we shroud the body, then we shroud the body. We're, we're beyond that. Okay. It's bad for the soul. I mean, I don't know a hadith or, or a tradition that says that. So, but I would just say that I wouldn't encourage. By the time we come to the mosque to do the janaza, I wouldn't encourage that. What matters the most is praying the janaza prayer as many rows as possible. The talqeen, which is a sunnah that we, most people don't do, that's also something important. That's what's important for the deceased. 
And I think if family members get emotional and upset, which is understandable and happens, I think we need to remind the family members that we're doing this for the honor of the person who is going to you know, die. Can a woman lead a recitation, qiraat, or nasheed in a gathering of men and women? In Indonesia, women recite beautifully, and some sheikhs get very upset and say this is haram. The voice of the woman is not an aura, and there's no proof for that. The ulama that say that the voice of the woman is an aura, it's a deduction because they argue that the entire body of the woman is the aura. So we'll just throw the voice in there with it. But there's no evidence, there's no standalone evidence that the voice of the woman is an aura. As a matter of fact, the ulama that say that the entire body of the woman is the aura, you ask them, why do you say that the voice is the aura? And they'll say, And if you go to ask them, then ask them from behind a barrier, which is a proof against them because you're going to listen to what the wives of the Prophet <laughs> are saying. So this proof doesn't even work. As a matter of fact, it's an exact proof of the opposite that the voice of the woman is not an hour. There's no hadith, there's no tradition, there's no verse in the Quran that says that the voice of a woman is an hour. Furthermore, we have the hadith and the sayings of all of the great companion, women companions and wives of the Prophet I saw some Sayyidah, uh, Sayyidah Aisha was a mufti, she used to give fatwa, people would come to her to learn the religion. I mean, how, how could she do that if the voice of the woman is the hour? So the vo that's number one, the voice of the woman is not an hour. Can the woman read Quran in front of people or sing? Well, okay, can she read Quran in front of people? Yes, as long as she knows how to read Quran. Is it common? No, but that's a cultural thing. But there's nothing haram about it. And that's why on Friday when Ennis was sick, we had the sister read the Quran. And I know there were people that were upset. I mean, tough to be upset. I mean, our job is to teach Islam not, and practice it, not to make people happy. Is it permissible? It's permissible. She, does she know how to recite? She knows how to recite. Khalas, it's fine. How about singing? As long as she's not singing in a seductive way, and as long as what she's saying is not seductive, which is the same thing that we would say for a man, it's permissible also for a woman to sing in front of a mixed gathering. Is it normal? Would a woman come to the mosque and sing? No, but it's not haram. Why is it not normal? Because of the culture. Because most Muslim cultures are patriarchal, but that's not from the Sunnah either. Okay, so the, so the voice of the woman is not an aura. There's no proof for that, specific proof for it. And uh, I've mentioned this before, people like Ibn Hajar al Asfalani, he had hundreds of female teachers. He is considered Amir al-Mu'mineen for hadith, that's his title. He is the commander of the faithful in hadith. He's written the most famous and most uh, authentic and most rigorous commentary on Sahih al-Bukhari. He has an encyclopedia on all of the companions and all of the narrative. I mean, he's just an ocean of knowledge. He had hundreds of female teachers. So that's the tradition that we want, not the tradition where it's always men doing everything. So the voice of the woman is on the aura. She can recite Quran, that's fine. How else is she gonna learn and teach? And there are many women that are teachers of the Quran that have high ijazas and, and uh, teach you know, some of the great reciters uh, that are men are, are taught by women. So uh, we just need to keep that in mind, okay. Uh, the Quran was not revealed at a time, but it is arranged in Juz and Surahs. Who created this arrangement? Okay, there were no ajza in the Quran. The, the Quran was revealed, you know, piecemeal, of course, over 23 years. And the, the Prophet, Sassan, through the instruction of Gabriel, organized the verses in order and the Surahs in order. So the 114 Surahs from the Fatah to the Nest, that was Gabriel's teaching to the Prophet, Sassan, and that was the Quran. Until Al Hajjaj ibn Yusuf, uh, who died in the year 95, he wanted to divide the Quran in seven equal parts so that he could finish the Quran once a week. So that was the first introduction into demarcating the Quran. And then, about 100 years later, there was an, an alim named Imam Abu Bakr ibn Ayyash, who died in the year 194. He said, Well, maybe the Hajjaj, you know, for all of his negative qualities, he used to read the Quran once a week. Maybe he had time. We don't, you know, the normal Muslim doesn't have time to do that. So why don't we just divide the Quran in 30 equal parts so that you can read a portion every day? The idea be that being that each juz more or less has the same amount of letters as one another, 
So they are roughly the same size, roughly. So in the in the end of the of the second century, the Quran was was carved up into the thirty ajzat that we have till today, and then the generations after that, they said, well, why don't we read half of the juz during the day and half of the juz during the night? So they divided each juz into two his. And the reason they called it a his is this is a time in which all of that were writing um, books that taught Muslims things and prayers that they can say, ahsab that they can say in the morning and in the evening as a way to regulate their, their day and have a portion of remembrance, so on and so forth. So they called each half of a juz a his. And then they divided it even further to facilitate that they would read in the, in the different rakats of the prayer throughout the day, a ruba, a fourth portion, so that throughout the day they can easily facilitate how they read the juz. So that's how we got all of that. And there are other demarcations. This is more of the ones that are famous in the East. I know in the West they have other demarcations. They have a tun, the eighth, so on and so forth. And this is all from the ijtihad of the ulama. I remember you saying that it is too hard to lower your gaze as a result of the haram being everywhere. It's no longer haram as long as you don't look with lust. The problem is that the gym people are dressed very inappropriately. So every look feels inappropriate. What's your advice? The idea of that statement, that's a statement that is attributed to Jafar al-Sadiq and Imam Jafar, when he was in the uh, far east, uh, uh, sorry, in the east, the lands past the Oxus River, Transoxanian, and um, his companions complained to him that the women were not covered and they were bare chested and things like that. So he said, the, the haramness of looking has been suspended for you because the haram is everywhere. And this in the Sharia is called Humum al Balwa. Uh, it's when, when a calamity is so pervasive that you cannot avoid it. So that teaching, there's an outer and an inner part to that teaching. The outer part is that in a, in a society like ours, nobody covers. Even in the Muslim community, not all the women cover. So the vast, vast, vast majority of women are not covered. So where are you going to lower your gaze? That means everywhere you go, you can't drive, you can't work, you, you, you'll be constantly looking down like this, which would create a situation that's not, you know, not tenable. So one of the principles of the Sharia is when things become difficult, then we automatically find a way to open them and become expansive and become ease. So this doesn't mean you can go, if you're a guy, you can go around looking at women, but it just means when you see a woman that's not covered, that, that glance is not going to be haram because it's just pervasive everywhere. That's the outer sort of meaning. The inner meaning is that the lowering of the gaze is an issue of lust, not looking at the women for lust. So you're going to the gym to work out, not going to the gym to check out people. It doesn't matter what the member of the opposite sex, you know, is dressed like. The idea is not to focus on that, to focus on what you're doing. If it's difficult, then try to go at a different time. If it's too difficult, to go to a different gym, you know. So, I mean, be, be creative. But don't say, oh, I'm having different keep going to the beach and I can't, I mean, don't, don't go to the beach then, you can ask the question. This is the wrong place to go to ask the question. But everyone does what they can and inshallah ta'ala will reward you. Is techno music permissible? I don't even know if I should answer that question. There's nothing inherently haram about it because it's all digital, so there are no instruments for people to think that the instruments are haram, which they're not. But again, when it comes to music and singing, the good of it is good and the bad of it is bad. That's what the Prophet said about poetry. So there can be good poetry, there can be bad poetry. There can be good music and bad music. Uh, good singing and bad singing. It all depends about, you know, what the words are, what it allows people to do, so on and so forth. But music in and of itself is not haram because music is sound. And the, the, I think it was Hassan al-Attar, uh, rahimahullah, was a famous sheikh al-Azhar, he was, he was the generation before Muhammad Abu. He said, if, if you see the flowers and hear the birds and, and, and can't understand that this is beauty and that this is music, then you're a donkey. Right? So his, his point is that this is natural. Music is something that's natural, that happens outside. You, you, you go outside and you hear the sounds, it's natural. That's what music is. Just different tempos, whatnot. So music in and of itself is not haram. It's what the music causes you to do and, and so on and so forth. 
The Alamah themselves, they wrote about music. We mentioned this before. Okay. Only two more questions. Yeah. Oh, yeah, from the chat. From the chat. There are some in the chat. Let me finish these quickly. When I was in high school and less practicing, I would talk to and got close with someone of the opposite gender. Is it haram for me to text them and check up on them and say happy birthday and things of that sort? And I still think about them. They are Muslim, but it feels wrong to do so. It seems like unnecessary interaction with the opposite gender, and there's still a feeling of attraction. And the Akhi or Ukhti, you answered your own question. You said, I feel wrong. Right? So if you feel wrong, don't do it. Right? Now, ask yourself a question what if you're married and you do this and your wife finds out or your husband finds out? Would they be happy? I know the answer to that question. They would not be happy. <laughs> because Allah Ta'ala created inside you this fitra, this natural, you know. Dispositions and step the qalbat, the Prophet said. Even if people give you, many times I answer your questions, you guys don't like my questions. And you just follow what you want anyway, because that's natural. Well, he, he's gone crazy, we don't know what he's saying. Even though I'm right and you're wrong, but it's okay. You may have established that you have the right to have your own opinion. But the Prophet said, you have, to, you, have to, you have to do what you feel comfortable with, even if somebody who you believe is of uh, proper knowledge gives you the answer, still you're going to end up doing what you think is right. So you know that this is this, this inappropriate. And when it comes to the, the gender interaction, you have to be very careful because it's a very, very slippery slope. And I've said this many times, any, any woman can hook any man. I firmly believe this it doesn't matter what they look like, whether any woman can hook any man. Allah Ta'ala created this that way. It's very, very easy. And any man, he just says the right combination of words, he can hook any woman. And it's just natural. And as a matter of fact, it's a wondrous thing. It's, it's, a, it's a thing that Allah Ta'ala says is from his divine signs. But when we're not married, we have to be careful that we don't cross that line and that we reserve that capacity and express it in its right way. Last question. What is the first look? This must be the same person. <laughs> what is the first look? Does it mean that someone can intentionally look at someone they think may be attractive once, or must the first look occur by accident and be for a specific person, like looking for the intent to marry? Can you elaborate? The first look is the look that just happens. You're walking about or you're at work and you, your eyes come into contact or see somebody, a member of the opposite sex. That's the first look, right? If we are looking at lowering the gaze as opposite of what I just said, that the second look would be haram, you would lower your gaze. I mean, that first look doesn't count. But in, in my, what I was saying earlier, or the teaching of Imam Jafar is that there is, there is first, second, third, all of that is no longer embedded in, in and of itself. The haram is not there because of its pervasive, okay? But rather it's an issue on the inside is not to look with lust. Now, if you're checking somebody out because you're interested in that person and you're marriageable age and whatnot, that's also, that's permissible because you have to look at what you're going to, to marry. And this is the sunnah of the Prophet Sassan who told the Sahaba to look at, at the members of the opposite sex in the, in the case of wanting to get married to make sure that they're comfortable with that. Those are the written questions. Are there questions that have come in? Yes. Uh, you mentioned during the marriage seminar, good character and deen is most important in a man for a woman to marry. How important is the family in getting married? And is there a valid Islamic reason for parents to deny that person? If, if somebody has good character and they have deen, then there's no justification to reject that person. That's what the hadith is saying uh, of the Prophet addressed to women. He doesn't come from the right family or there's some oddities in the family, unless it's you know something glaring like, uh, you know, I don't know, just, uh, you know, parents are like mass murderers or I don't know, something crazy like you know, barring something extreme like that, I would generally say no, there is no just there's ten, I would tend to say there would be no justification to reject the person based on the person's family. Parents oftentimes want their children to marry in a certain they have a certain rubric that they want their children to follow and to marry. And in that is mixed intention. Some of it is, is well-guided, but some of it is also misguided. 
Because as I said, it's not just about, yes, the family compatibility, that stuff is important. But you can't reject somebody because their family are not as materially well off as you. But they're a good person. That's, that's, that's a disaster. Uh, or uh, skin complexion or the tribe or ethnicity. You know, I'm Pakistani, but they're Afghani. Or I'm Arab and they're, or, or I'm uh, North African and they're from the Gulf. All this stuff happens all the time. We're not free of those biases. Me, myself, we all have those biases. But that's why we have these texts to remind us that that's not the determination for a successful marriage. All right, next question. I'm concerned about back paying zakat. My children have investment accounts from their grandparents, from their grandparents that are not retirement accounts, but simply stocks to be used for education. We are never paid zakat on these. What would you recommend? If it's the 529, is that what it's called? Okay. If it's a 529, there's not going to be Zakat on it because that's for the purposes of the education. If it's not in that instrument, it's not if it's not in that instrument, but the grandparents, as the questioner said, gave it with the intention that it's used for um uh, for yeah, it's restricted for the use of education, then we will say that there's no, no zakat on it because it's earmarked for something. And last one is the pig heart. Can you repeat that answer? Pig um, heart? Just the... like that? <laughs> pig heart. Repeat. So, the question is on the pig heart. Um, following the recent and successful heart transplant with a pig heart performed by a Muslim surgeon, I would like to know how Muslim scholars will approach this event. For a long time now, pig valves are used to replace damaged valves in the ear. So as I said, when it comes to issues of medicine, the Sharia allows uh, generally for the use of impure substances in the case of medicine, whether it be medication you're taking or whether it be transplant and things like that, the Sharia tends to be liberal. So in that case, it would be okay, especially if there is no alternative. And I, I said, I don't know in this case if there's an alternative or not. If there's an alternative, I think as Muslims, we would just prefer to have the alternative. But if there's not, uh, and this is you know a life-saving thing, then there's, there's going to be no problem with that. There isn't forgiven. That's it. Yeah, I think that's probably gives me a question. Is it too much to pass on one's birthday? Like, is it soon to pass on one's birthday? Yeah, the Prophet also fasted on his birthday. But then make it your Hijri birthday. But he fasted every Sunday. He fasted every Monday. Yeah. Yeah. The Prophet Sassan fasted. He said, Why did you fast on Monday? He said, Have a little feet. So it's as if he celebrated or acknowledged his birthday every week, every Monday, not every month, every Monday. Now, my wife hurt her hand, or her right hand, and it's bandaged. And she wanted to know how she can make you because she doesn't want to get the bandages. It's just McTamel. Okay. It's on the stone. I have a good question. After you make the penny, I'm trying to have a phone or after shave, does that have a telephone? This has nothing to do with wudu. This is separate of wudu. No, I think let's say, my mid, I'm going to do wudu, then something after I have a phone. I apply a bathing house phone. Yeah, no, because, the because we'll, we will follow the opinion that says that the alcohol in that case is not nages, it's not ritually impure, so that would be okay. It's like mouthwash that has uh, alcohol in it, it would be the same thing. And all of the sanitizers that we've been using for the last three years are all alcohol. <laughs> That's it. Thank you. Anything else? Okay. Allah Ta'ala Allah Ta'ala Rasulullah Muhammad Allah Ta'ala Rasulullah Muhammad Allah Ta'ala Rasulullah Muhammad Allah Ta'ala Rasulullah Muhammad Allah Ta'